Women are upset because in June of 2022, they woke up one day and to find that with a stroke of the pen, they had been relegated to second class citizens in their own homes. And women are upset and angry because in the greatest country in the world, we are being denied access to critical health care. Michigan Deputy Attorney General Christina Grassi did not hold back during her closing statements in this week's hearing over the state's abortion ban. And today, a Michigan judge blocked enforcement of the ban for months until voters or the state Supreme Court can weigh in. In reading his decision, Judge Jacob Cunningham noted something very interesting about the 1931 law. This statute is the product of the 57th Michigan legislat legislative session, notably comprised almost entirely of men. Judge Cunningham also addressed the impact this ban would have had. Subjecting providers to criminal penalty for medical care that was available, not to mention safe, as the testimony suggested, safer than pregnancy itself, without any justification from the state for doing so, simply does not pass constitutional muster under our state's constitution. Women and all persons capable of caring children, not having the ability and freedom to consult with their medical professionals without fear of prosecution, puts the government into the patient examining room. A person carrying a child has the right to bodily autonomy and integrity, as well as a safe doctor-patient relationship free from government interference, as they have been able to do so for nearly 50 years. With us tonight to discuss two of my absolute faves, political strategist Rachel Bittacoffer, the author of the forthcoming book, Hit Him Where It Hurts, How to Save Democracy by Beating Republicans at Their Own Game. And John Della Volpe joins us, director of polling at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, of Politics uh, and author of Fight, How Gen Z is Channeling Their Fear and Passion to Save America. Rachel, you have called women mobilizing after the row reversal a pink wave. Can decisions like this really build momentum that's going to make a difference come November? Well, I remember very early on in this cycle giving an interview to a publication, and they asked me about Roe and whether it would have an effect on the midterms coming up. And, you know, I, I, at that time I was thinking, you know, they'd probably restrict some, um, hold up some of these bans and the prohibitions that they've been putting into place. But I was so dubious that they would take the step of evisceration of Roe that I just, I told, I remember I told the journalist that I just didn't really think that that was very likely to happen. And the reason why, guys, is because that is, Titanic, as the video that we were watching as the lead in for the um, interview, uh, as the attorney was citing, for women, the per Personal is now political again. We, you know, we, with a stroke of the pen, lost that freedom of bodily autonomy. And it really does change the moral imperative, which has favored the opposition to abortion over the last 30, you know, 50 years. Now it's um, putting that moral imperative on women and girls and the, the reality of what these restrictive, really draconian abortion bans will do in public policy terms. John, anecdotally, we are hearing that scores of women across the country are registering to vote. What are you seeing in the data? I think it's far beyond anecdotal evidence, uh, Stephanie. We see in most every state in the nation, starting with Kansas, significant increases of, 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 of women registering to vote. And those women who are registering are overwhelmingly Democratic women, specifically younger Democratic women, number one. Um, as Rachel said, I think this is a second midterm cycle in a row where there's a series of public events that are transforming the shape of the electorate. In 2018, we saw this with the youth movement following the Parkland uh, shooting and what those young people did. We're seeing the same thing now post Dobbs. Stephanie, before Dobbs, Democrats were already doing better than most people expected by drawing close to even or maybe down a couple of points Republicans. Post Dobbs, we see Democrats leading in most uh, in most national surveys and in several of the key states, there's been about a four or five point shift pre and post Dobbs. Most of that shift is coming from, from supportive women moving from undecided Republicans to Democrats now. Rachel, these bans or restrictive abortion laws are not an accident. They're what Republicans have been pushing for for years. Now that they're happening and they're seeing the impact it's having, the backlash with women, are they realizing the one thing this is going to do is shrink their party. They were never going to lose the white evangelical vote, but now they've just made them extra happy and they risk losing scores of women. 
and extra happy people don't vote, right? I mean, I think we're four years past the negative partisanship you know, theory being deployed in elections, and we're seeing again and again, it's fear and threat that make people motivated to vote. So the losers of a fight are going to be more motivated. The people who you know lost beating Brett, Brett Kavanaugh's nomination are more motivated than the winners. And here we really see Republicans, like the shrewd ones like Mitch McConnell, they never wanted to catch this car. They understood exactly what would happen when they did. And that's why when the memo leaked, I think it was that night or the next day, I tweeted about nobody other than women. You know, in the political sense, though, Mitch McConnell had a very bad day finding out that Roe was going to be completely gutted because he understood it would be a Titanic shift. And now we're seeing Democrats capitalize on it, too. It, it's not enough that you get the shift. You're really seeing strategic effort to exploit these advantages. And that's how twisted politics is. Mitch McConnell had a very bad day realizing Roe would be gutted. But of course, it's what he and his party have been promising voters for years. John, what I want to know is, are we seeing more women get more motivated, register to vote, activate in redder states where these abortion bans are being put in place than, let's say, a New York or California, where women feel safer about their access to reproductive rights? Yes, Stephanie, there is a correlation between the, essentially the redder the state, the more angry and, and, and the more likely women are to vote. In fact, the states that where women are most vulnerable and, and, and most likely to lose their reproductive rights also are the ones that overlay with key Senate battles in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, Arizona. In these states, women's reproductive rights are in question more than a lot of the traditional blue states. And that's where we see specifically independent women stuff. Before Dobbs and the Alito League, uh, Republicans were winning, in, were winning among independent women by a couple of points. Today, Democrats are winning by 13 points with plenty more undecided on the fence ready to tune in, I think, post-Labor Day. Be careful what you wish for. Rachel Bittacoffer, John Della Volpe, thank you both for joining us tonight.